Welcome everybody. This is our third Shires Brass Repair Seminar. Um, we are so thrilled to be bringing these to you and getting a chance to connect with you in this way. It's been really very exciting for us and we've had a total, total blast getting an opportunity to, you know, geek out a little bit and, and connect with, this is a huge, hugely important part of the industry. Um, and so much of our own background comes from the repair side and so many of our uh, instrument technicians and builders come from a repair background. Chuck Shepard, who's gonna be our featured presenter today, um, is obviously a, a well-respected member of the community and we're so, so lucky to be able to work with him and he's been with the company for 25 plus years. Um, right from the beginning, starting SC Shires in the basement with Steve Shires. So it's, it's a really, fun and unique opportunity for us to present on a fun topic um, featured on dent and dent repair and, and Chuck is a true magician and wizard here. I'm going to stop talking. The only other thing I'm going to say is uh, I encourage you to pin the video. It has Kenny Pyatt's name right there. Um, so you can pin that video. Make sure you're muted on your side. If you have a question, pop it into the chat. We'll take a break for questions about halfway through um, we might be able to work them into. We'll see how things are going with Chuck and Kenny on their side. And then we'll leave some time at the end for questions as well. We have so two more sem two more seminars um, next week and then the last week in March. So those are the same time, same place. We've been sending out little email reminders. So hopefully you're getting those. But we're so thrilled that everybody's been able to join us for these. And I would love to hear, um, I'll put the contact info in the chat as well. If, if you like these and there's more topics that you think would be really interesting, or if you'd like to, you know, schedule time for more of a one-on-one -on -one session with our technicians in your repair shop, send us an email at uh, repair at seshires.com. I'll, I'll put that in there as well. But I, we, we've had a really great time with these and it kind of exceeded our expectations. So anything that we can do to be a resource for you all, we'll, we'll be sure to do so. So I'm going to turn it over to James really quick um, so I can stop talking and then we'll get going. Hi everybody, I'm James Monahan, uh, General Manager here at Shires. Um, again, echoing what Sam said, thank you all for joining. Thank you for the interest in, in learning um, and allowing us to uh, kind of share some of our experience and knowledge with you guys. Um, so presenting today, as always, Kenny Pyatt, a uh, wonderful trumpet player. He runs our repair department here at Shires also in charge of all of our play testing. And then Chuck Shepard, who uh, I, I personally have learned a lot from in my tenure here at Shires. And um, I, if anything, am as just as interesting in watching Chuck do dent work as, <laughs> as all of you are. So I'm hoping to take some notes and learn some stuff, even with myself. Um, Chuck, please, at this point, why don't you introduce yourself and, and give us a little bit of a rundown on your experience. And, and... All right, good morning. Good afternoon, good evening, everybody, wherever you are. Um, as Sam said, I've been here for 25, actually almost 26 years now. Um, I did start in the basement with Steve. Um, originally, I started as an apprentice with Walter Lawson in 1975 in Baltimore, Maryland. Um, I was there for eight years and learned a tremendous amount from Walter Lawson, who's, he's the wizard, um, as far as I'm concerned, is, with dent, dent work and repair work. So I was there for eight years and I moved on to Boozy and Hawks in New York. And from there I went to the West Coast to Southern California where I worked for Zig Canstall and Joe Marcinkowitz and then for Anaheim Band Instruments. Um, well, I learned a great deal at Zig's and at uh, Marcinkowitz. Um, there were a lot of great people there. And while I was in Southern California, I met uh, Steve Shires at a seminar somewhere. I can't remember exactly where, uh, but he recruited me to come to the East Coast uh, again to work for Osmond Brast. Um, I moved in the middle of the winter after being in California for six years, and I thought, what am I doing here? I must be nuts. But it was a great work experience there. Um, and after, let's see, four years, I believe it was, that um, Steve then kind of went off on his own and started the S.E. Shires Company in the basement of his house in Medway. <clears throat> and we were there 
for a year until we got kicked out by his uh, wife and family. So we started to overtake the house in a most unreasonable way. So we ended up in Hopedale, which is just a couple of towns over from here. And we were there for 20, about 21 years. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and through everything we went through over the past uh, 20 years, we were able to end up here in uh, Holliston, Massachusetts uh, with, as Eastman Brass, the S.E. Shires Company. Um, yeah. So. And that's, we've been here ever since, right, Chuck? Yeah. So, so I think we're gonna do some dent repair now, right? Yeah, I th thought I would do is start off and then introduce you to some of the tools that I'll be using. And uh, get started with that. Cool. Um, as you can see here, I've got an assortment of burnishers that um, actually most of these I've made. Um, I've got one here that's been started and not quite finished, but on this end here, you can see where I started from just a piece of uh, sheet steel, uh, 4140 sheet steel. And through sanding and whatnot, I ended up with a contoured burnisher, which isn't bent yet, but it's not done, but I found some uses for it just as it is. I have another burnisher that I use quite a bit, but made out of a file with two radiuses. And a couple more burnishers, these are made out of uh, tool steel Again, sanded and polished. Um, I keep these polished with a white compound. For those of you who might be interested. Why, Chuck, do you use a white compound over some sort of other buffing compound? It seems to work the best on a hard material as opposed to Tripoli or Red Rouge. <clears throat> um, then I also have a, uh, a set of the bell sickles and the ro standard roller, which I use a lot. Then I have uh, several dent hammers, um, several very just standard dent hammers that I've had for years. I do have this particular one that I use most of the time, which is a little unusual, but um, it really is a, kind of a workhorse for me as far as a hammer goes. I do have a hammer with the replaceable heads on it, which I have different material heads that I use. I have a, you can see here kind of an assortment of different heads for, for this particular hammer. A lot of phenolic resin, nylon. I've got wood, I've got brass, uh, Delrin, just depending on what I'm gonna be working on. Kind of what what the how the mood suits me for that. Um, one little trick for this type of dent hammer and for the replaceable heads is to, I made a collet with a shoulder in it to be able to hold the head, so you can either reshape it at some point or actually contour it when you're making it. It's a lot easier to hold it with uh, an emergency collet that's been bored out. Um, so why don't we get started? Absolutely. <clears throat> what uh, what are we going to do first, Chuck? I thought first we'd uh, start on a bell uh, bell flare. I'd like to kind of go through a sequence of uh, burnishing and straightening, um, and show you a few little tricks that I've learned with uh, contour burnishing that might be helpful. So to get started, got a polished bell. Oh no, that looks pretty good. So we'll, get, we'll start with that. I'm gonna grab my. So Chuck's I just grabbing. have to say the the microphone with the sound of the bell was just fantastic. So thank you for <laughs> making my Wednesday afternoon really a happy thing. You're welcome. You're welcome. We're not done smashing things yet, so. Stay tuned. 
I'm going to take just a flat burnisher and there's one or two ways of straightening the rim on this one is you could use a kind of a generic bell flare mandrel and um can you guys hear chuck okay or you can do what i'm doing is just having it on a peg and i'm going to be pushing the flare back into alignment And this one's pretty kind of hard and springy. So Chuck, it looks like you're just pressing on the rim of the bell, correct? I'm just, I'm just pushing it with the burnisher. You could use your hands. I just find it easier and have more control with the flat part of my burnisher. It's just pushing it. I'm pushing it pretty hard because this one is pretty springy. Okay. Then I'm checking it to see if I can get it kind of true. And they're kind of going back and forth. And I think what I will do is put it on the block and see what it looks like. So right now, Chuck was just uh, trying to get the rim of the bell as flat as possible, um, not necessarily paying attention to the, the dents and the creases in the flare so much as getting the, the rim and the bead flat. Is that correct, Chuck? Yeah. And I may, in straightening that rim, I may actually be adding to the damage of the bell just a little bit. I could be distorting it a little bit more. But we're going to take care of that in the next step. I'm going to start with the roller. Try and get out the worst of that wrinkle. There's nothing particularly special about this. I'm just, you could do it with a burnisher, but I find it easier with a roller. It's a little bit quicker. I think I would like to back up just for a moment. Um, on a bell with a, like a lacquer or a silver finish, particularly, I would, um, Clean the uh, flare with the bell before I actually start rolling it or burnishing it. So what Chuck's using, what we use to clean the brass is Zep Dazzle. It's both a polish and a protectant uh, for the brass or the lacquer. You could use pledge works, but I've found this dazzle to be a little bit better. You want to make sure to clean the brass or the lacquer or the silver first so that you're not pressing any of the dirt particles into the finish of the bell. We'll start with that. And continue. And the roller is something also that I keep well polished with the uh, white compound. This is our wood with a uh, burnisher. <clears throat> I'm moving kind of away from the rim now. Sam, are you able to hear Chuck when the microphone is a little bit farther away? 
Yeah, it's he has such a nice resonant voice, though. It's definitely better if it's closer so we can get a little bit more clarity through the mask. What are you looking for right now, Chuck? I'm looking to see if I can, at a point where I want to take a burnisher to it. And I think that's what I'm going to do is <clears throat> grab my favorite burnisher. It was also made out of a file. I'm going to start with the worst crease and try and lift that up. So the raised part of the dent is on the side of the bell where your burnisher is. And so you're pressing against the raised part uh, to try to push it out flat. Here's the high spot. Let me see if I can get under the bell, see how you're working that. And we're now going to hit the outside of it a little bit to kind of blend it in. To see what I'm, what I've got. And I'm it's starting to look like a bell. So you're kind yeah. of going at both sides with it, using different parts of the burnisher here to attack different parts of the dent. So now I'm going to kind of continue around. And just continuing around, working the high spots from the outside of the flare, and then kind of blending it in a little bit from the inside. And I'm pushing pretty hard on this. This is again is a little bit springy, and kind of hard. but it's certainly workable. I'm glad it's not an old ambassador, which would be like a tank. That would be a real challenge. But this, and again, can it, I'm also coming in on the inside of the bead where it's uh, wrinkled a little bit. So I'm working that. From the underside, so I can actually see it. I don't know if you can see that on the camera or my burnisher, but I can see my burnisher moving the, the brass. Okay, so we're Now what I'm going to do is kind of focus on the rim a little bit more, and I'm going to use this other burnisher, and I'm going to I'm going to use the edge of it to get up under the bead. I've always struggled with this part of it, and I found this just using the edge of a burnisher be my best bet for getting the kind of the crease out that runs right along the bead. And I'm pushing on it pretty hard. Just while we're working on this, we had a question from Aaron um, asking if the ZEP prevents the lacquer from scuffing from the burnishing. Yes, and it uh, prevents the scratching. 
or helps reduce the scratching between having a polished burnisher and then a, essentially kind of a lubricant. You can uh, try and protect the finish. Um, the other thing I can do too, I have um, Murphy's oil soap that I also sometimes use as a kind of a lubricant or a protectant. And then uh, just kind of standard wheel bearing grease. I can do I'm just brush it on, make a mess. Here. You can always tell when Chuck's been working on a dent repair because that red sludge is all over where the dent used to be. So that's a good marker for uh, us craftsmen finishing instruments where we can see <laughs> when the work has been done. And this grease is uh, kind of translucent or transparent enough that you can, you can pretty well see what you're working on. I'm just going to continue. So Chuck, I think uh, basically what you're doing, it really is just looking for the high spots and pressing into them with your burnishers. Yeah. Is that essentially what it is? Trying to raise, raise it up. I've got a big ring around where the bead uh, kind of ends and the flare continues. So I'm trying to raise that up. I got to a point now where I want to take out my straight burnisher and go around it to try and blend it in and see what sort of progress I've made on it. Go back. Go back again, make another pass on this. Going back and forth on a kind of a smaller area at the moment, just focusing on that. I'm going a little bit, a little bit further out on the flare with this particular area.
Uh, we just had a question in. Um, do you do you have a Z60? If so, would you use it for this repair? Um, Z60. I'm assuming you're referring to a, a dent machine. I don't know. I mean, uh, it's a Faris part number. Oh yeah, a dent no, machine. No. Yep. Yes. yes. So, um, if I knew how to use it on smaller bells, I would might use it. Um, I just don't have ex a great deal of experience with trumpets in the dent machine. Um, similar question that just came in about that same exact thing. Do you find that, and maybe it's just that you don't have as much hands-on experience with the machine, but do you feel that there is an advantage to doing it by hand and using these various burnishers instead of the dent machine? Is it just a control issue? I can control what I'm doing. I can see what I'm doing uh, probably a little bit easier. Um, Especially on smaller bells, Chuck, would you say that a lot of it is just such a feel thing because of the tiny areas what you, that you're working on? Yeah, it is definitely a feel, and every bell is a little bit different. Some of our bells um, on our customs, uh, our piccolo bells, our CVLA bells, any of our lightweight bells, the gauge of the metal is so thin um, that I think. Uh, a lot of the dent work that might need to take place on the thinner bells needs to be smaller tools with, uh, and definitely a, a touch, touch and go, touch feel sort of thing. I think you guys are all able to see how methodical Chuck is. It's really amazing watching him do some of this dent work in the shop because it's like a moment of zen <laughs> amidst like a crazy chaotic shop. It's pretty wild. So I think I'm going to go to the uh, bell sickle now. Again, this is highly polished with a white compound, but I'm going to put some grease on it. Then it He's using the uh, Valvoline grease to grease up the, the bell sickle here to keep everything from scratching, both the tool and the bell. So I'm going to try and just blend in this area kind of away from the, the bead. Chuck, while you're doing that, um, Aaron has a question. He's asking if our bells if they're if they don't harden as much from burnishing because of softer brass it really depends on the bell model um but this one is hardening up as i'm working on i can feel it is there anything to be concerned about as you're working the bell with it becoming too hard or cracking or not playing well when you're done I'd be concerned if the wrinkles are more severe. Um, there is a chance of cracking. And particularly if the bell has been damaged a couple of times and it has a severe wrinkle, there's much of a greater chance of having it crack. Locate where the sickle is in relation to the bell. I couldn't hear that. He's trying to kind of locate where the tool is in relation to the bell. So he's tapping on it lightly um, to try to both hear and feel where the steel of the sickle is hitting on the bell. If you're just tapping on brass. So Chuck, maybe I'll put the microphone up. You can tap where it's just brass and first and then tap where the tool is. 
the metal there and then actually there's the circle and just brass. So there's a little bit louder sound when you're definitely on the tool because you're hitting on more metal. And there's kind of a hollow, thin sound if you're just uh, if you're just on the bell. It's a little hard to hear with the background noise in the shop with the compressed air going. Just another quick question that came in, and um, Kenny, maybe you want to throw it to Chuck as well. But how often do we anneal in the shop before performing dent work? I don't know if Chuck can hear well with the noise in the shop. I very rarely do that if a bell is to the point where I have to anneal it. If it's been that badly, badly damaged, we'll just replace it. Um, so there are occasions when I will anneal something, um, probably more so in the, the crook of the bell has been damaged. But there again, for the type of work that we mostly do here, we're going to be replacing rather than repairing if it gets to that point, unless it's a customer's instrument and we have to go to extremes to save it. But so I've got this to a point where now I'm going to kind of try and restore the contour of it, what I call the contour of burnishing, and I'm going to go kind of laterally on it. Chuck, how much pressure are you putting on this? Because I don't see that you have any tool or any mandrel under this. Um, I'm putting just a moderate amount of pressure on it. Um, it doesn't require a great deal. And then I'm going to kind of go around it in the air. Chuck, where did we source the, the bell sickle? Uh, that was from Germany, from Bohm. I have a set of three of them for trumpet, tenor trombone, and bass trombone. I'm also going to go around it on the inside just to make sure I've kind of blended everything in. We have an area that I'm not particularly happy with. I don't think I've ever heard Chuck say that anything is a hundred percent, even though to my eye, it always looks incredible. He's got such a fine eye, which is why he's a magician, but. I'm gonna clean it up a little bit and see what we've got. And I can, I can say I've never seen Chuck do a dent repair start to finish like this kind of in one sitting this quickly. Um, Chuck, you're pretty notorious for starting a dent repair and then getting to a point, putting it down, clearing your mind, coming back to it minutes, That's, weeks, months later. Yeah, uh, sometimes I do. I have to set it aside and take a break from it and then come back to it with kind of fresh eyes. Um, it really seems to help. So I think for our purposes, that's kind of the sequence that I've gone through. I wanted to show that. And you can, I've got some scarring. But I've restored the kind of the contour and the shape of it. 
Chuck, can you speak kind of uh, in broad strokes how um, after a dent repair like this, you might attempt to smooth out the finish of a bell, raw brass, lacquer, silver. Is there any uh, sort of finishing that you would do to make that look, look less like it had dent repair done? Um, you could sand it really lightly and then buff it and get it prepped for either being relacquered or silver plate. Um, there again, if the bell is in, has been really badly damaged, I'm not gonna go to extremes with the file and sanding and buffing and really risk changing the thickness of the metal and perhaps uh, affecting the way it plays. Again, we'll just consider replacing the bell. Would you say on silver plate something uh, slightly more abrasive than polish, something like flits might be appropriate to use to try to smooth out some of the creasing? Um, what I really like using is a, a green compound, green rouge, and then I'll follow it up with red rouge for silver, and that really cleans it up uh, very well. And as long as you don't go too aggressively at it, the, the rouge won't take off so much of the silver that the raw brass starts showing through. Yeah, you can, you've got some room to, to work with the silver plate. Lacquer is not quite as forgiving. We did just get another question really quickly from Nick, wondering about whether or not there's a way to avoid or minimize scarring. Avoiding scarring. Um, there's no way to really avoid it because you're essentially stretching the metal when it's been damaged like that. Um, I think by burnishing on a sickle or you know perhaps using your dent machine, you're gonna be able to blend it in enough to kind of hide it. Um, but a lot of scarring is just kind of inevitable, so. So uh, next, and we can certainly take more questions on uh, bell flare repair uh, on the rim and, and the flare. I think we're going to move to the bell tail uh, of an instrument. And again, this will be on a trumpet. Straightening up our workspace so we can destroy more things and then fix them. Oh my gosh, don't break that. No. Oh. Um, we might. No. I thought I would go through this repair because it seems like some people uh, run into a difficulty when the bell crook or the, the crook of the bell gets bent over. And we see that in uh, shipping damage sometimes. And I think it's important to kind of straighten it out before you take the bell off if it's uh, to that degree of needing kind of re repair and help. So we're gonna... Uh, that's better. Oh no! That hurts so bad. Happy St. Patrick's Day. Yeah, I'm glad this isn't my horn. So it's... Really rather simple. I just have kind of a crude setup of a pair of two by fours and a one by two. And normally on a finished horn, I would use a piece of leather or a piece of rubber, kind of sandwich it in there. And it's just a matter of, I'll show what I'm gonna do. Just a matter of kind of reversing the damage. Chuck, where would you say that you're putting pressure on the horn when you're doing this? Well, on the, probably on around the bell stem and the first valve. Are there any areas that you absolutely do not want to be pressing on? I probably want to stay away from the second bend because of the, this one was really bent on that, that first bend area. I'm gonna, I'm leaning pretty heavy on it.
Chuck's putting a good amount of pressure on that horn. I'm gonna zoom out to kind of show you uh, how he's using the weight of his body to kind of press down near the valve section of the horn. He's, he's putting a good amount of weight on it. Take the second slide out. Taking the second slide out right now, because yeah. if that second slide starts contacting with the table, uh, you're going to start getting dent in the crook there. I'd recommend keeping the valves in the horn, uh, keeping the horn together so that the horn will keep keep itself in alignment i'm going to bend a little bit or press a little bit on the second bend while you're doing that chuck we got a question why not freehand that on a trumpet stem mandrel while supporting the braces i'm not strong enough <laughs> <laughs> this way i can use my body weight on it and i can control it with my hands so I've got a great deal of kind of control over it. Um, but for me, it's just for the body mechanics, it's easier to be kind of on top of it rather than alongside it. Another quick question. Do you ever need to re-anneal the brass while doing the dent work, especially if it's starting to harden up from overworking? Um, really just once in a while, if it's something is needing of that kind of degree of uh, attention, we're gonna be replacing it rather than repairing it. Um, if I were doing a re repair, kind of a general repair, I might consider annealing. Um, but I would try and do it to, so that I'm not um, changing the characteristics of the horn, trying to change it as little as possible. Um, so, yeah, that's a good point, Chuck. There's uh, a lot of you know custom and professional horns out there that, if you heat the bell up, it sort of changes the composition of the brass. It changes the hardness or softness of it, and that absolutely will affect how it plays, especially in the in the bell bend of the instrument. Yeah. I've got that straightened out. I've got a wrinkle in the the bell tail brace. And normally with something like that, I'd take the, the brace out and go around it with dent balls. Um, I might even consider taking the bell off because I've also got a problem here with the front Z brace or the back Z brace. But now once that's straightened, it's a lot easier to work with if I do need to take the bell off rather than trying to straighten this off the horn, at least for me, it's uh, easier. So. Do we, before we move on to, I think we might take a look at maybe a tuning slide dent or uh, trumpet second slide, but before we move on, do we have any more questions yeah. on the process um, for repairing the bell tail? Daniel just wrote in asking, are you keeping the main tuning slide off the table when you're adjusting the bell bow like this? Uh, yes, I am. But I needed, I needed the space to, I needed to remove the second slide to actually have the room to be able to press down on the body of the trumpet and because it is a little springy. If we have more questions coming in, I'll be sure to throw them to you guys. Um, but yeah, why don't you go ahead and, and keep going because we can always circle back. Um, Another thing we run into once in a while with uh, shipping damage is the second slide getting pushed into the casing. And come on. 
You're forward. having too much fun, Jack, I think. Yeah. I think oh, this yeah. is. Okay, so now we have the <laughs> second slide syndrome set up. So this, this uh, as I'm sure many, most, if not all of you know, uh, you'll, you'll get someone who mistakenly or not uh, maybe set their trumpet down upside down uh, with the valve slides facing to the ground and they set it down a little too hard. And because that second slide protrudes out of the valve casing, uh, that just at that special angle, um, it'll get bonked. And what happens is uh, because the, the, the second slide acts as sort of a, a lever to warp the casing. Uh, so, well, speaking of levers, I'm going to use the first slide as a lever to try and find the knuckle that's causing the binding problem and try and just reverse the damage. So just trying to reverse the damage, basically. Uh, using And you can also tell just how well something has been soldered or not. So this one is going to be a challenge. I need to re-solder that. Let's see if this other side... It's going to come apart too. So this one would require completely resoldering both legs. So let's go to plan B. We have a plan B horn here. So. <laughs> We don't always keep trumpets around just to smash, just for everybody's edification. This is a special circumstance. You do, Nathan. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we should. It's like the perfect thing to get you through the week, apparently. Chuck, I so really Chuck, you didn't break the trumpet correctly the first time, so you broke another one. <laughs> So what Chuck's doing is uh, he has the first slide uh, in the top leg of the tuning slide outer for the second slide, and he's pressing up gently on the first slide while also working the valve, the second valve of the horn, so he can kind of see uh, where the warp in the casing might be if it's closer to the top of the casing or closer to the bottom of the casing. I feel like there should be a support group for repair techs who see some crazy stuff on brass instruments. There may be, do you already have one? Is this just a part of the world that I don't know about? So crazy. There's on Facebook. <laughs> There's everything is on Facebook. <laughs> see with a little bit of oil if it's. And instrument repair horror stories. Yeah. Okay, cool. I'm going to have to do a, a deep dive. I'm going to go past it just a little bit and allow the knuckle to kind of spring back. So he's pushing the, uh, the knuckle of the 
outer slide of the second slide uh, past where it feels good, just so that maybe a little bit of the metal memory can come back and put the casing um, perfectly back in round. I think I got it. Yeah, looks good. If you needed to, you could lightly lap it. Um, again, you want to be careful of the compression of the valve. If you're going to go to that next step. Um, so that's straightening out the second slide. Chuck, if you were to lap the piston, what what grit uh, compound would you use? I would use a thousand grit. So it's pretty fine. Um, and I would make sure there's that the lapping compound is pretty wet with oil just to prevent anything from galling. So how are we doing on time? I see we have about five minutes left until the one o'clock hour. Um, we could, uh, we have time probably uh, for those sticking around for just the hour to take some questions on any of the repairs that we did. Um, also, uh, we also have a trombone tuning slide that we could dent and take something out of that if you'd like to see that. So uh, James and Sam, I'll let you kind of dictate what happens next here. I think it'd be great um and really fun to see the tuning slide and for those who have additional questions i'm sure we don't mind sticking around for a little bit longer past the hour and for those who have to leave that's fine um and then any other further questions that maybe we didn't get to that you'd still like to ask feel free to put it in the chat or send us an email at repair at scshires.com and we can help address those for you Just while we're starting to get set up for the tuning slide, we um, we had a question about keeping the second slide in and adjusting the receivers together. If I had a, if I had a third slide or a third water slide, um, I would probably use that as well. So that would give you the two legs of it, if that's what he's sort of thinking about. Cool, thank you. I might need a little more clarity on that. But yeah. Chuck, you don't have enough leverage to just use the second slide, right? Correct. I need the, a little bit longer. Sometimes you can, I've even used a steel mandrel to push them around depending on how hard the casing is. Because the third slide or the first slide just isn't enough. Um, yeah, so while you're still getting set up, um, maybe Chuck, Kenny, or James, um, we had a question from Alicia asking, how often do you consider leaving a small dent in a horn because the potential damage to the finish outweighs any potential cosmetic gain from dent removal? Uh, um, that's a great question. Yes, yeah, so a good question, and that's a tough one to answer. Um, it really depends on the circumstance with the customer. And just the nature of the dent that, we're, that I might not address. Mm -hmm. And maybe how secure you are in you know, your own individual ability to get that, that dent out, I'd imagine, is yeah. factors into it. Yeah. Um, so it's a real judgment call about dealing with something like that. Cool. OK. Um, so yeah, let's do tuning slide. And then somebody also asked maybe about seeing something related to hand slides. So let's, we'll get through tuning slides and see where we're at. And if anybody has to go, this will still continue to be recorded. So you can always visit it back at scshires.com slash repair seminar. I'll throw that in the chat. So this is, you know, pretty basic, pretty basic straight ahead dent work. 
Um, What tool do you have there in the in the vise? I just have a, a man, dent mandrel with a uh, just a screw on ball. I have a couple of different balls to choose from with this. And I think I'm going to switch mandrels. Thank you everybody for bearing with me on my shaky camera work. I'm using my weak non-dominant hand to hold a cell phone and then I have our uh, trumpet bell microphone set up okay, here uh, so we can hear myself and Chuck. <laughs> so I've gone to a straight mandrel. I really want me to serve. And again, I think Chuck's just feeling for the high spot on the inside of the crook there. Um, I'm just watching where the ball is, kind of burnishing it from the inside, as it were. I'm actually going to put a, just a little bit of grease on this. I'll go with my curved burnisher. So Chuck was watching sort of where the, the ball was as he was pushing up on the dent from the inside, raising it up just, just a hair past where the contour of the crook is. And he's taking a burnisher now uh, to the tiny, tiny, tiny little high spot that he made to make sure that it's burnished down in line with the rest of the crook. I've still got the low spot that I have to deal with. So for a lot of dent work, there's a lot of back and forth, slow, tiny uh, movements of the metal. Go back a little bit of back and forth to get everything smoothed out as cleanly as possible. Takes time, takes a lot of time for a lot of this. And I'm trying to, trying to not go too far. I don't want to create any more high spots than I can uh, deal with. So I'm trying to be careful about the pressure that I use on this and really control it. It's kind of easy to push a little too hard, just trying to be a little bit quicker with it. Um, I'll take my straight burnisher. And a recontour of a radius. So this has no curve on it at all, right, Chuck? It's yeah. just a straight burnisher. Straight. Yep, perfectly straight.
there are, there are occasions when I might use a curved burnisher on something like this, and I would angle it so I get more surface area of the burnisher contacting what I'm working on. There's another, another option. Just depends on what the brass feels like, what the dent is like. So I've got a question from uh, Daniel. How often do you use your your how often do you use your dent hammer? Um, it seems like today you've done most of your work with furniture. Um, I would use it more on like a bell crook with uh, dent balls. Uh, if the if I had managed to damage that flare a little bit more on the trumpet bell, I would have taken probably my nylon uh, tipped hammer. To it to before I burnished it, um, but I wasn't successful in really destroying the bell, so I wasn't able to demonstrate that. Just more practice. Just more practice. Yep, have to do it again. So here we are with this. Yeah, so let's take a look at this. Um, try to get it from some different angles here to see if. And by George, I can't really see where that was. So it looks like you did a great job. <laughs> the lacquer is a little scarred, which you probably can't pick up on the, on the camera. Yeah, we're getting a good amount of glare, but the lacquer, Chuck was saying, is, is a little bit scarred. Uh, is there any way to smooth out the lacquer, the cloudiness of the lacquer? Uh, no, you really need to strip it and, and re lacquer it. So that's uh, that's about what we have lined up. Um, if anybody has any questions, we're happy to, to answer them. Yeah, someone did ask uh, about some hand slide dent work. Not necessarily that you want to take a hand slide smasher right now, but maybe you can address um, maybe just a couple of your thoughts, Chuck. Um, well, hand slides or hand slide tubes are extremely challenging because, as you, as you know, they're thin and very hard, very springy. And there just isn't much uh, kind of give to the tube uh, when you're working on it. Um, so I don't have a magic bullet for slide dents. Um, and again, with the, what we're doing here, if the slide is bad enough that it's going to be scarred, uh, then we're just going to replace the tube. So we, you know, I've got that luxury of being able to do that. Um, I know some people will anneal dents as they go along on a hand slide. Um, it's tough for me to do that because of uh, lacquer issues. Well, it's tough for anybody with lacquer issues to anneal it, but that is another option when you're working on a slide dent. We do very often that. have um, texts from the community reaching out to us about re uh, getting parts to repair slides and slide outers and inners and stuff like that. So if, if there's something that you come across that you need, of course, we're always here to, to help with those things too, um, just to Chuck's point, but. With a dent in a hand slide tube, I would uh, probably start with my nylon or a phenolic resin head, just to try not to scar it anymore. Um, and I even would use my kind of my standard larger hammer on something like that just depending on kind of the severity of the dent and what it, what it feels like um just trying to see i think we're caught up with questions so far um chuck is there anything else that you want to add to this discussion since this is your you know this is your baby. Um, well, I think talking again about hand slides, hand slide crook dense is probably another one that's a tough one. Um, it's tough going around the crook, getting past the ferrule with uh, dent balls. And so a lot of times we just end up having to take the crook off. Um, 
And it's tough, given the length of the slide, it's tough to use a dent rod to even reach some of the smaller dents that, uh, that might be reachable. It's just, those are really tough. So just to add that to the hand slide discussion. There's another question about uh, slide dents, Chuck. Do you see many dents that are in both inner and outer slides that so severe that it actually holds the two assemblies together? I've run into that over the years. Uh, we don't see that here very often, if at all. We did have an artist yeah. who backed up over their case and the slide in particular had some pretty significant damage, I would say. But I don't think we ended up repairing that. I think we we're just like, hey man, you need a new slide. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was able to use on the one instance where I had a slide like that, I was able to I think it was on a lower tube, so I had access to it with a slide rod and able to kind of open it up a little bit, just enough so I could get it apart. Um, but thank goodness that doesn't happen very often. Ginger anything else? Kenny, I was gonna say, Ginger Kenny, is there anything else on your end? No, I think, um, this is really great, Chuck. I I, I, learned, I certainly learned uh, quite a few things that I hadn't actually seen you do in this much detail before. So this is great. Um, we don't have any new questions in the chat. Um, so I think uh, unless anyone else has any any other questions that we think we can cover uh, quickly, or Chuck, any any parting comments or sage words of advice. Um, I just want to thank everybody for attending. And if you do have any further questions down the road, don't hesitate to contact me or us at the repair. Yes, repair. Yeah, so, oops, I'm gonna put that into the chat here one second, repair at seshires.com. And uh, you can access all of these recordings at seshires.com slash brass seminar, right? Okay. Um, so we still have two seminars left. We're gonna cover some, is it soldering uh, techniques and repairs for both trumpet and trombone for the next two weeks. Right. Um, so if there, if there are any other suggestions of things you'd like to see, or you wanna connect with our team a little bit further, please feel free to reach out to us at repair at seshires.com. We've had a total blast and Chuck, it's so nice to be able to feature you and the work that you do a little bit. So thank you for being a part of it today. Oh, you're welcome, and thanks again for putting this together. I love the microphone setup. I'm going to use that in the showroom, I think, <laughs> for the next time we have, like, a event. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, otherwise, we'll see everyone next, next week, and thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, everybody. Cool. Bye, everyone.